We mentioned that uh, tonight with team number two, they will be meeting in the annex for not only assignments but also soup and sandwiches. That's team number two. This morning we're going to talk a little while about prayer. Just going to remind ourselves about the importance of prayer and how wonderful prayer is and bring out some things that will uh, hopefully help us have a desire to pray to God more often and uh, have that as an active part of our Christian life. In fact, the Christian's prayer life is essential. We don't always know what to say when we're talking to God. We don't uh, always know how to proceed. But uh, still, prayer must be an active part of our Christian's, of a Christian's day. Now, we struggle. Each day we struggle with trials and temptations that threaten to tear down what we work so hard to maintain in our Christian lives. And a couple things that help us in these battles is our own resistance coupled with help through proper prayer, which enables us to overcome the tempter. Prayer then would be a key ingredient to a successful Christian life. And so it's important that we learn how to pray and that we talk to God on a daily basis and don't think that it's something uh, foreign or difficult. Uh, it should be as routine as, as breathing. And yet, oftentimes in the Christian life, it's not. Well, let's talk about some of the wonderful aspects of prayer. First off, prayer allows access to God. When David's friends were treacherous toward him, he wrote in Psalm 55, verse 17, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. David was glad that God had given him access through prayer in talking to his heavenly Father. And there, you know, that brings out some exciting thoughts about prayer. When we pray unto God, we are talking to the creator of this universe. And that's exciting. On the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6 and verse 9, Jesus says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And to the Ephesian brethren, Paul gives encouragement in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So our prayers are not uh, spoken into the wind or into nothingness. God being omnipresent, being all everywhere present, uh, is able to hear those prayers and is listening. In fact, prayer, the Bible says, brings us into His presence. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, Prayer is something that brings us into that throne room of heaven, into the very presence of God. And it is in that position that we make petition and supplication and desires for our Heavenly Father for things that we need in this life. And that's exciting that God has allowed us that kind of access. This access to the throne room of heaven is by divine invitation. In the kings of, of old, when you examined them, you weren't just allowed to go and visit the king anytime you wanted to. You couldn't just walk into the throne room, hey king, what you doing? How are things going? It wasn't like that at all. In fact, one good example in scripture of this is in Esther. In Esther chapter 4, when she had to go before King Xerxes. King Xerxes, that uh, rule is mentioned in that text about 
no one can come into the presence of the king without him uh, inviting you. And if he did come and he did not put his golden scepter out toward you, then you were put to death. Uh, so you didn't just go and, and visit a king without invitation for a fear of death. But God invites us. So our ruler invites us to the very throne room through prayer. And that's a wonderful thing. In Psalm 50 and verse 15, Scripture says, And call upon me, God, this is God, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. He wants us to call upon him when things become difficult. He is waiting for us to go on bended knee and to approach our Heavenly Father. Prayer is not exclusive. Prayer is available for all believers. Notice in John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says, If ye abide in me, and my word is abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now when Jesus is originally giving this, with some other verses we look at, he's talking to his apostles. But those same promises are repeated later on by John in some of the last letters of our New Testament as referring to all Christians and the power of prayer in our lives. Prayer isn't something that just the spiritually powerful engage in. Prayer is open to all Christians without exception. First John chapter 5, 14 through 15, the aged apostle writes, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Because God has promised not only to hear, but to answer our prayers. When you look through Scripture, much of the Bible is actually sections of, of prayers that people have, uh, have been written down by God and they have given unto the Lord in, in their petitions. And uh, those things, some of them are very beautiful. Some are short, some are long. I want us to notice just a few. And notice the kind of people. These are just ordinary believers in God that are praying. Hannah is a good example. She was a maid servant. She wasn't a, a person of any kind of uh, eloquence or position. And her story is in 1 Samuel. We're going to notice chapter 1, beginning of verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. By the way, Hannah had no children, and she wanted a, a child, and she had been barren. But now Eli, the priest, the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord, and she wept in anguish. So she's praying to the Lord, she's weeping, and then he goes on to tell us her prayer. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then... I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. And we know the rest of the story there, because we are able to look back and see the Lord answered this prayer, and she got Samuel, one of the uh, most wonderful prophets that we have in the Bible. And not only did she receive Samuel and do exactly as she had vowed to do, uh, and turn him over to Eli. But also, she had many more children after Samuel that she did not have to give uh, up at an early age. Another just common person, the public and the tax collector, one that uh, a lot of folks wouldn't like, is found praying. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 13, the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes unto heaven. But beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord said he went down to his house justified. The dying thief is another example in Luke 23, verse 42. 
Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I shared those examples because I want us never to feel like we don't have a right to pray. Maybe we have things we're struggling with in this life. Maybe we feel worthless. We need, all, all of us need time and prayer unto God. And God desires that we all engage in prayer. Your family needs you to pray. Friends, our country needs you to pray. Our congregation needs you to pray as well. One of the things that prayer does is it anticipates God's answer. Prayer is a privilege because God has promised not only to hear, but to answer that prayer. It moves the very creator of the universe on behalf of his creation. That's a powerful and amazing thing. In Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, God says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. In Isaiah 65 and verse 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. God is so excited when people turn to Him in prayer. He is ready. He, he's chomping at the bench to answer these things, to help us in the furtherance of our Christian growth and in the kingdom. His desire is that we do turn to Him. Instead of trying to handle things in life on our own. Because of that, it gives us confidence when we pray. Originally to the apostles, Jesus stated in John 14, 13 and 14, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now that had a special meaning to the apostles. For the power of prayer continued long after the apostles, and it was present long before the apostles. In John 16, 23 through 24, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask you will receive that your joy may be full. The apostles were being told that they were going to be able from this point on, uh, you know, after the glorification of the Lord, uh, to ask things in the Lord's name. And our prayers today are given unto the Father through Jesus Christ. God wants our prayers answered, it seems, sometimes even more than, than we want them answered. As I said, He is waiting, longing for us to approach His throne room. God desires our fellowship. He wants the church to succeed in this wicked world. In Luke 12 and verse 32, He says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sometimes, there's a breakdown between the Creator and the creation. Friends, if there's a breakdown between our prayers and God's will to answer, it lies with us. Notice what James says in James 4, 2 through 3. Some reasons why prayer breaks down. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. See, God is about the furtherance of the kingdom. He is about the spiritual strengthening of the individual. He is about spiritual things. He desires those kinds of things to be in uh, the, the, the prayers that we give unto Him. If we are first seeking the kingdom of God, then all the trivial things, all, all these material things will be added unto us, if that's the Lord's will. But our goal in prayer, our 
desire needs to have a spiritual foundation. Not so that we can spend things on the lust of the flesh and worldly desires. Sometimes people go, I've been praying for that new car. I just really got to have that new car. And, uh, things like that. To me, that I understand that to be praying amiss, according to James. The wrong motivation behind talking to our Creator. 1 John 5, and verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. But if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So once again, although originally that promise was made to the apostles, we see in 1 John that at the close of, uh, during the close of the verse 6, that uh, in fact all Christians are able to pray through Jesus Christ. And if we ask according to his will, he not only hears us, but he answers us. Prayer is powerful in that. It achieves what would normally be impossible. Prayer has the power to summon the providential response in a natural world. We only see with our physical eyes. We can only uh, use those five senses. And yet, through the power of prayer, God in His providence is able to work things out for the benefit of His creation his children, and in his good pleasure. Notice in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, this is why they couldn't cast out that demon in the first century. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, once again, this was a time of miraculous things. In the first century, and Jesus is talking to his apostles about um, the uh, lack of, of faith that they had at this time. We know that many of them didn't really develop full faith until after Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. Peter had certainly changed. They didn't understand about the kingdom, the coming church. And yet we also see in this text that there is great power in faith coupled with prayer. And that has continued. We can look at scripture and see some examples of prayer and their providential responses. Now, when you look uh, all through the book of Esther, we just mentioned that a moment ago, um, you know, it's... It, the providence is seen very clearly in the life of Joseph. Providence is seen very clearly. We have to believe in the power of prayer. Elijah on Mount Carmel, he believed in the power of prayer. We're going to notice this account twice. This time we're only going to go to verse 38. And it came to pass, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. And I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So he offered this prayer unto God. God answered, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, the stone, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. We also know that Elijah is said to have a nature not unlike our own, and that when he prayed that it would not rain for three years, God answered that prayer. He was a man of faith. Abraham was also a man of faith. And Lot was called a man of faith. He lived in a city called Sodom. 
a very wicked place. Sodom was going to be destroyed. And I want you to notice the intervening of man and how it affected the relationship with God and God's actions. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 23, Abraham came near and said, Would you destroy, he's talking to God, would you destroy, also destroy the righteous with the wicked? This is a prayer. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? And be it from you to do such a far, from, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And God answers. He said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. And that was at a time when God was speaking to the patriarchs and his family. Today he speaks to us through his word. Written word. Moses, for Israel, intervened in Exodus first, chapter 32, 11 through 14. Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? He prayed unto God, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Who's so pleading with his father. He says, turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. What was the result of the prayer? For the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. God will bend his will to the faithful's prayer. If we look at ourselves, we can probably see that we're living better lives because of the power of prayer. We can see the answer to prayer throughout our lives. God desires the advancement of the kingdom, as we mentioned a moment ago. And that's what prayer does. Prayer advances the kingdom of God. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and 1, the Bible says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. So here, Paul is telling those in Thessalonica what to pray for. Something that is, is important. Pray for Paul. Pray for those who are in prison because of the faith. For those that are spreading the gospel. That the word may run swiftly, may spread abroad, may affect the lives of people. And that they may glorify the truth. Simply our prayers and influence events. Even events in places where we can't go physically, but we can go in prayer. It can influence times in which we will not live. Times for our children and our children's children. It can influence overseas works. Family in distant places. Policy in government. The sick and shut in. We don't even have to leave the privacy of our own home in order to affect powerful change through prayer in these areas. Isn't that amazing? That's the power of prayer. It doesn't lie in the preacher. It doesn't lie in the building. You don't have to go to a special place or 
be a special person in order to pray unto God. The power is those who pray in faith anywhere you are and at any time. It's teaching about prayer. So I'm going to of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogue and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Surely I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Prayer opens doors. It hinders evil and heals the sick, all in accordance with God's will. In the Church of Christ in Rome, in chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. Paul knew the significance and the power and the strength of prayer. And so he would always pray for the churches that he had planted. Those individual Christians all scattered throughout his missionary journey. And, and the strength and, and the uh, strengthening of not only them, but, but of the uh, congregations as a whole. And that the gospel would continue to spread. He wanted them to work together. And to understand that power of prayer. In Romans 15 and verse 30, he says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. So he also knew that he needed the prayers of God. Prayer, beloved, shows God's grace. I mentioned there is a connection between the prayers of men, the power of God, and the faith that it produces. Prayer can result in a stronger faith. Because when we see God act, when we see God move in our lives and answer to the prayer, then it builds a strength in knowing that, yes, God loves us. God is listening. God is, is able to accomplish things that are beyond our own ability. Back to the example of Mount Carmel there in 1 Kings chapter 18. We won't read that whole narrative again, but this time we'll add verse 39. If you remember, he offered the prayer <coughs> Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. He knew that in answer to this prayer, these people were going to be affected in their faith. And then verse 39 tells us that when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Maybe we don't feel as close to God. Maybe we don't feel like we're really engaged in the Christian life very, very much because we have a weak prayer life. Maybe you're not praying to God as you should be. There are four things that prayer declares. I'll share with you and then the lesson will be yours. First, prayer declares His grace and that He allows... All of us. He allows sinners access to that throne room of heaven. Secondly, prayer declares his goodness and that he is willing to hear and he's willing to answer his imperfect creation. Number three, prayer declares his greatness and that it unleashes the power of God in our natural world. Number four, prayer declares his glory. And that it shows him to be the only true and living God. After salvation, 
Prayer is really the greatest privilege that we as Christians can enjoy. And instead of avoiding prayer, being afraid of prayer, thinking that we're going to misspeak and, and upset God, or uh, we're going to be embarrassed or ashamed, uh, let's just wipe the slate clean, let's start afraid, start where you are, let's begin talking to God, talk to Him as a friend that you reverence, that you know has all power and all knowledge, at the same time, loves you like a son or a daughter. Take advantage to go to the very throne room of God in prayer and realize that when, you, when you're being led in prayer, and you know it's easy as human beings to be distracted. And that's why I think he mentioned to go into that room to close the door. When we enter into prayer, we are entering into the presence of God. And so when we allow ourselves to be distracted through the little things to where that we almost can reach a point of making a mockery of this avenue of prayer because we're thinking about other things or we're fiddling with things in our hands or not closing our eyes, looking at things around us and being distracted that way. Prayer is a serious thing. Even though in a public sense that we have someone standing up here doing a public prayer, you as a congregation, we, we, we are supposed to be all praying together. Nothing wrong with you mentioning some things in that prayer in your mind that you need to address with God. But don't allow that as well to be the only time that you engage in prayer. Because in private prayer are mentioned many, many, many more times in Scripture than public. Because prayer is a very intimate thing between the Creator and the creation. In fact, if we don't pray, I'm afraid, what it's going to be on, on Judgment Day, we're going to hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you, because you practice lawlessness. How would he not know us? He's all knowing. Well, he doesn't know us, because we did not routinely and regularly go to him in prayer. We didn't spend time with him. And that's how we talk to him in then prayer. So think about your relationship with God. There's a number of things that prayer does for us and, and helps us with. And, and as Christians, we have that blessing of being able to understand that we're here for a purpose and that God's desire is for our spiritual health and for the health of his church. And so we can ask in accordance with that purpose. You're not a member of the Lord's body. We want to offer you the opportunity to become a Christian this morning if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're willing to repent of your sins and confess His name as being the Son of God. We'll baptize you into Christ this morning. You'll be added by the Lord to His church, Acts 2 and 47, and you can, from that point forward, live faithfully unto death and receive that crown of life. If you have left the Lord, we invite you to come home. We saw with the sorcerer, Simon, in Acts chapter 8. Whenever we read the Bible, that when he fell, he was a Christian. He had to pray unto God. Encouraged to do that by the apostles. If he would do that, then he would be back in right standing with him. Father. So if you have left, you can pray to God with sincerity, asking forgiveness, and the blood of His Son will cleanse you of sin. If you desire for us to pray with you,